Hi there. Welcome to Discussions with the Fashion Masters. This is going to be an epic conversation. I am so very excited to be interviewing Jason Prawl. Um, just so I don't miss any of the amazing things that he's been doing, I'm actually going to pull up his bio and read it for you. So here we go. Jason Prawl is a health educator, practitioner, author, and filmmaker. In 2018, his independent research and experience as a practitioner led him to create the Human Longevity Project, a nine-part film series that uncovers the true nature of chronic disease in our modern world. He's currently working on his next film series that explores ancient methods of healing mind, body, and soul from indigenous cultures around the world. And he's also the author of the book, Beyond Longevity, a proven plan for healing faster, feeling better, and thriving at any moment. Welcome, Jason. It is such a pleasure to have you here. No, oh, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Yeah, you too. So before we dive into like the whole world of Jason, um, relevant to today, I'd love to dive into a little bit of your past and really what led you here, because I think like most of us, we really found our understanding of how to approach the body from our own personal struggle. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, that would be awesome. Well, it's funny, you actually said it perfectly, how, how I ended up here, um, actually with you and, and discovering block therapy. It's actually very relevant. So I, at 13, was suffering from some chronic pain uh, in my knees and doctors told me that it was overuse and I was an athlete. So, you know, I guess that led them to that conclusion, but at the end of it, the, well, they couldn't find what was really going on, right? It was like inflammation. They couldn't figure out what it was. So they said, oh, it's just overuse. And, and, and even at 13, I recognized how absurd that answer was, right? Because there's 40 something year old professional athletes that have been playing professional sports at a high level for a long time. And I thought that this doesn't make any sense. It's not overuse. So nevertheless, I got, you know, the standard kind of treatment, which is just rest, right? Just stop doing what you're doing. Right. And yeah. telling a 13 year old athlete, um, that's literally playing sports 24 seven, um, 365, it's just not an option. Right. So that was kind of, um, it was unacceptable really. And that and it really was the spark that kind of the seed that was planted in me that the medical system is just not equipped to diagnose and or help you understand, let alone provide the, the treatments or therapies or solutions for chronic issues. And so that was kind of the seed. And then my pain persisted for almost 30 years and, um, you know, in various kind of ways. But, and then I had skin issues in my early twenties, same, same type of thing. I came in, told the doctor that I've got these skin, skin symptoms. And they basically told me I had seborrheic dermatitis, which is just a Latin way of saying the exact same thing that I told them, you know? So I told them that my skin was, you know, itchy and it was flaking and it was oily. And they said the same thing back to me in Latin. So, you know, um, again, that was, that was kind of, uh, that, that led me to finding the solutions on my own or figuring out what it was. Right. And that was the early days of the internet, right? Like Google didn't exist. You know, there was no social media. I was in chat rooms. I was on web crawler, right? Like trying to find answers on the internet. And I didn't really have the resources, um, to find naturopaths and integrative practitioners. They weren't as abundant, um, as they are today, at least, um, you know, you couldn't find them easily. So that propelled me down a path of self-discovery and, and learning what health really is and where it comes from and what are the things that are actually blocking this sort of natural um, capacity for us all to be healthy. And so that's been my journey um, and, and, you know, led me to quitting my engineering job and starting um, a new profession um, as, a, as a health practitioner, integrative health practitioner. And and that's what I've done for the last, you know, 15 years. And, and it's a continual evolution of understanding, you know, and oftentimes it is through the, through our own lens that we learn the best because that's really where wisdom and experience comes from. But, but being a practitioner like yourself, you start to your, your clients that are coming to you or people that are, that are asking you questions or, or, or needing help from you can also provide you windows of insight. And, um, you know, I'm sure like you, you're always learning something new and it tends to come from these new difficult cases. And so that was my story. It was like, I'd help some people and I thought I was really good at what I was doing. And then somebody new would walk in and I can only get them so far and then I'd get stuck. And I'm like, oh man, back to the drawing board. Got to go learn something new. Don't understand what's happening here. And so on and on it goes. And, and again, eventually that, that's what led me to block therapy. And I, I can't be a bigger advocate for, for what you've done. Um, I've got my blocks around the house and I, I tell everybody I know because it is 
there's so much embedded in the physical structure, no matter if the origins are mental, emotional, uh, you know, inherited things that we, that we have, um, or even some might say karmic, right? There's all kinds of things and they, they all compress down into the physical manifestation of chronic illness. And so, um, that's kind of where I am today and, and I'm, I'm constantly learning. And I mean, I just, I love that so much because I mean, I, I think we as the practitioners that had to figure it out on our own and then are always open to learning more, it's, it's fascinating how the medical model is so grounded in what they understood from before. Yeah. It's stagnant. It's so stagnant. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we're, we're always evolving. We're always, we're always learning. I mean, like hopefully in the right direction. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I question things, but I take a few steps back sometimes, but yeah, you know, yeah. that's just, that's kind of the nature <laughs> for sure. So, okay. So let's dive in. So this is a very different world than it used to be. First of all, like I remember I, yeah. I did a, a podcast with somebody and they said like, compared to the the fifties, there's like 144,000 more toxins. And that was even a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm banking on the fact that there's even more than that compared to back then. So, you know, when, when people are coming to you and they're absolutely riddled with, with confusion, because there's so many layers, what, what's your first thing to direct them to even approaching their body in any kind of like beginning and systematic approach or way? The, the first core, sort of core understanding that I'd like to get across is that whatever you're experiencing is caused by environment. So what does that mean? That means your mental environment. That means your emotional environment. That means your physical environment. So in other words, there's nothing inherently wrong with you, right? Your body has unbelievable wisdom, right? There is wisdom and intelligence even beyond the body, right? So, so that's a, a, it's a really, really core piece of understanding. Like to really ground that into to one's being and to be able to embody that truth is very critical for success, right? So there's nothing wrong with your thyroid. There's actually, there's nothing wrong with my knees. Like my knees know how to be knees. You know what I mean? Like there's not a problem there. The problem is, is the things that I've experienced throughout this life, and some might say uh, other, other realms, um, these things will manifest in physical deformities, manifestations of inflammation, whatever the case might be, but there's nothing inherently wrong with you, right? And that's really, really key. So if we start from there, then we can, then we can start to, to branch out and say, okay, well, what is it in the environment? Is it, the, is it your limiting beliefs about what's possible? Is it the things that happened to you when you were a child, perhaps even before you had a memory? Is it things that you inherited, right? We know that, that Holocaust survivors, the children of Holocaust survivors, uh, have notable uh, transcription factor changes. So we're actually seeing the genetic changes in survivors of a Holocaust. We've seen this in, in mice studies as well. Um, when mice go through a maze and they're electrocuted, um, and, and they, and they sent like, they smell lavender, for example, I actually was cherry blossom. They smell cherry blossom. They get electrocuted, right? So they start to associate this spike in the nervous system, this hyper stress response when they, when they, uh, smell cherry blossom. Okay. Well, that makes sense, right? We can explain that through the nervous system, but then one, that's one mice, let's say it's the mom. Then they, they have a pup, right? And the pup of only one parent of this pup has experienced this trauma. But that pup also has this spiked nervous system response when they smell cherry blossoms. So this is a, a this is code that's passed down through the lineage, and it's a very intelligent process, right? And then that mouse pup breeds with a new mouse, new mouse that doesn't has never experienced trauma. So the second generation, again, only one parent, two generations removed, has experienced this trauma, and that grandchild of that of, of the of the original mouse has that same expression at the nervous system level. So this is passed down. We don't exactly know how, there are some theories and ideas, but this is really important, right? So it's an environmental stressor that has caused this two generations down. So it can be that, it can be toxins, it can be mold, it can be, there's all kinds of things that it can be. And so we just need to figure out what are these sources that have caused this adaptation or reaction or modification to expression of health or what are the things currently in the environment that are preventing, blocking this expression of health? I, so, so that's that's a big, big realm. But if we can start there and we can we can suss it out, then we can start to find the real solutions. If I could just interject, because I, I just I just love this conversation. And um, when I was taking my yoga teacher training and I was diving into the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, 
You know, they mm-hmm. say that we're born into this lifetime with a signature posture and the goal of this lifetime is to break through that signature posture. So my interpretation of that is we are born into this lifetime with the breath of our mother. And then when we come into this world, then we're impacted by all the other things that life throws at us. And But we age from that perspective because I'm personally seeing that the youth today are in a completely different state of chaos than our generation or older generations. And I mean, the reality is, is, you know, the, the posture, the, the physical structure of the bodies are becoming more compressed and twisted at an earlier and earlier age. So the kids are so dense. So, you know, why, why is that? I'm even seeing babies not breathing diaphragmatically, like my generation, like I'm 55. So um, that was very typical, right? Where, you know, you're breathing diaphragmatically and then over time we lose that natural diaphragmatic breath and we start that secondary breath work. But now babies today are coming out very, very different. And so that just interesting, because like, that's how I interpret the the shifting and the changing of the generations and what's actually happening on a more um, global scale, but individually as well. So um, yeah, hundred percent. And in the West, we're seeing this more, I would say, than indigenous or rural populations around the world. And, and I go back to like, for example, Weston Price's work, right? So he was a dentist and he was trying to figure out what was really causing these dental issues that he was seeing in his practice. Um, and again, this was in the twenties and he went around the world to indigenous populations, right? In indigenous Australia, he was in Africa, he was in Switzerland, I believe, but he was looking at these rural areas versus some of these other more modern Western areas. And they were, he was looking at diet he was looking at all kinds of things. But one of the things he noticed was the palates of these children in these, in these countries that are indigenous, they had these big palates that were wide. They had plenty of room for their teeth. They had beautiful straight teeth, despite the lack of orthodontistry and, and, and other dental um, changes, they had beautiful mouths and teeth and beautiful jaws and facial structures. And so, you know, I took note of that, or, you know, maybe 15 or so years ago when I discovered that, I said, well, this is interesting. And there's a, there's a dietary component to that. Absolutely. And this is what we're seeing in the West, for example, relating to posture. So what we're seeing is malformed uh, jaws. We're, we're seeing a less than optimal expression of our natural capacity to build the mandible and maxilla. So if we don't have our facial structure isn't developed, then our jaws and and we don't breastfeed properly. And there's all kinds of reasons for this, but if the jaw gets compressed and doesn't, it doesn't develop fully, well, then we don't have room for our teeth. That also means that we don't have room for our tongue. So our tongue, which is a major postural muscle, right? Keeping us upright and, and shoulders back and all the things, is also being pushed back into our airway. So this big, huge tongue is now not able to properly fit in our mouth. It's not pushing our teeth forward and our jaw isn't, isn't forming correctly. So now we have this, this restricted airway in the back of our throats and in our nasal passages. So we're not breathing correctly. We're not sleeping correctly. And then if our jaw is not sitting on our spine correctly, and this, so we develop basically from two places, right? From the feet up and from the, the head down, right? And if any of those things are, are not formed correctly, then we're gonna have knee issues, hip issues, back pain, all that type of stuff, right? So this is a major one, just looking at the jaw and the proper formation of the jaw. If we get that correct, you know, from birth and, and we have optimal genetic expression, we get better air, we get better oxygenation to our tissues, right? Which is a big part of, I know, block therapy. It's just getting oxygen to all the tissues, right? This is life force energy. This is prana, this is chi. So if we're breathing correctly through the nose, we're getting you know nitric oxide uh, release of the cells, we're getting proper oxygenation, the carbon dioxide oxygen balances correctly, we're breathing correctly, we can think correctly, we avoid Alzheimer's, right? So that's one example of how the West has really gotten it wrong and we're trying to fix it with these, you know, teeth straighteners and pulling out wisdom teeth. And this is just a flawed solution because the real, and we can actually correct this now. There are corrective therapies where we can wear these sort of mouthpieces to start to expand the jaw, even as adults. I have one here um, because I wanted to go through this process, even though I didn't have a restricted airway and breathing issues. What I thought was, well, if I can get this, if I can optimize for this now, I'm going to, it's going to pay off for the next 40 or 50 years, God willing, right? So this is one simple mechanism that can cause digestive issues, hormonal imbalances, postural issues, chronic pain, you know, back issues, Alzheimer's. I mean, literally the list goes on, 
right? So these are the things that we're getting wrong. And again, with block therapy, with adjusting the mouth, with some of these corrective solutions, you know, yoga is fantastic as well. Yeah. Even Qigong, right, is, a, is an energetic way to address some of this stuff. We can start to unwind these issues that have been created years and years, perhaps decades ago. Yeah, and it was it was um, really amazing. So as I was going through my journey of like starting to really dive in and understand the body, this probably was, I don't know, 20 years ago. Um, I was still a body worker working over a table. And so, yeah. you know, the chronic neck pain, neck pain, typical of that stance. So now I'm on a two week holiday at a cabin and I'm doing yoga on the deck and I go into the, the forward bend and my typical neck pain is there. And I'm like, whatever. And for some reason I docked my tongue and the pain went away. And I'm like, Hello, what's yeah. going on right here? So like I, I started playing with that and that became such a foundational piece of, you know, what what we teach with um, foundation supportive exercises as well. Another thing that we do, which is really um, amazing is just, you know, I'll have my elbow resting on the table and put the thumb up into the roof of the mouth and just hold. And we're, we're broadening the palate or yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the roof of the mouth, like just to create that foundation, A, for the nostrils and everything you said. So I love chatting with you because we're so completely on the same page. It's, it's amazing. And, and if you go through some of these experiences, right, this is why I think it's so important that anybody struggling with health or is interested in optimizing health or maintaining health is to, is to explore as many of these arenas as you, you can, because you'll never know what you find. I had um, a really interesting experience. I did a um, 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat, right? And this is for those who aren't familiar, it's it, you kind of go to this re retreat location. Um, you're uh, uh, not allowed to talk for 10 days, right? So you don't speak for 10 days and that's because it causes distraction. And, and we're looking through the lens of sort of Buddhist meditation, right? Kind of the, the, the most direct line to, to actually what the Buddha supposedly taught. And we're meditating for I don't know, maybe 16 hours a day, yeah. right? And the rest of the time we're sleeping, we have two small meals, right? But you're just literally meditating, a very specific meditation practice. But during this time, during the, during this, probably the fourth or fifth day, I started to recognize, because I'm, I'm kneeling, I'm in a sort of a, a kneeling bench meditation. So I'm not sitting cross-legged, but I'm on my knees because that was the most comfortable for my knee pain. And so, and this was years ago, and I sat there and, and probably about during our two hour meditations, I'd say about half an hour, in, I would start to get pretty significant pain. And this type of meditation is a uh, body scan meditation. That's where it starts. So you're just noticing, you know, you're bringing awareness to the actual subtle feel, your, your, your actual sort of skin, if you will. And you can start to feel all around your body. At first, you, you may not be able to, but eventually you do. And long story short, at, probably on day four or five, I started noticing as I objectively observed my knee pain, so I wasn't running from it, I wasn't creating any danger or threat response, my knee pain actually started to subside. It started to reduce. And what this taught me, I didn't understand it then, but what I understand now is that we can actually remap the pain signals. So even though I have structural abnormalities and some fascia issues, and there's all kinds of stuff physically that I can work on, there's a component that is actually brain related to my pain. So in other words, the brain is creating this heightened pain response because through my past, through the environment that I've been in, it's been associated with danger. So this threat to actual physical issue was associated with danger in my sort of subconscious, if you will. So there's, it was a very, not only a subconscious, but a very real neurological connection between, you know, putting my pain in some, or putting my knee in some position and this idea of pain and how, how much of a threat it is. So you can actually rewire some of these pain signals. And this is what John Sarno found out, you know, decades ago when he was looking at back pain and he'd see two backs that were identical on the x-rays and one person can't get out of bed, the other one's running marathons. And he said, well, how is this possible, right? Because it went against everything that he learned. And he was able, you know, he's open-minded enough to say something, there's something I'm missing here. And now we understand some of this stuff and the research shows that, upwards of like something like 90% of chronic pain is brain based on some level. So in other words, there's a heightened response. Doesn't mean it's exclusively uh, brain based, but there's at least a component and, and pain can be reduced or eliminated by remapping this pain signal. So this is really, really fascinating stuff. And if we can apply that research, which I'm pretty confident we can to many other things in our reality, we can start to remap how we perceive the, the world in every way. I, oh, amazing. Um, so let's say somebody doesn't have 16 hours a day to meditate. <laughs> yeah, And that was my problem. I was like, how can I get rid of this? Because I, 
I can't, you know, redo this in outside of the, the that setting. So I had that same exact thought of like, uh oh, now what? Yeah. So what what are your five or ten or whatever the number is? What are what is your list of and, and like how do, how do you teach people coming to you as a new client to really tap into that magic that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. So it, it, let's let's stick with pain, right? And again, this can be applied in many other realms. But for pain, let's say somebody has back pain. So the idea is is that we actually want to. It's actually very similar to block therapy. We want to engage the pain to a slight degree. So it can just be sitting here that I have slight pain. Okay, good, great. And it's not debilitating, right? It's not overwhelming. If we're just engaging it just slightly, then all we need to do is actually observe and feel and recognize the pain for what it is. It's hot, it's sharp, okay? And you're, you're taking away all other context. You're just objective about what it is and you're just and you're you're actively feeling it so you can actually use awareness and this can be trained but everybody can do this is you can just notice the pain and you can just put your awareness on that pain and objectively observe it and if you can do that for five minutes a day great 10 minutes a day an hour whatever it is for you but just objectively feel and notice the pain without creating any danger or threat signals so now you're starting to remap that pain, so you're noticing the pain, but it's not associated with this danger or threat or I got to move or oh my God, right? So we're starting to remap. The other side is, so we do that and we do that as consistently as po possible. The regularity and the conditioning is the important factor. Mm -hmm. So it might take you a week, it might take you a month, it might take you a year, mm -hmm. but if you consistently do it, that will eventually get remapped literally in your nervous system. So we can remap that. Th there's another side to this coin. Um, we want to, whenever we're Let's say just if I'm outside laying in the sun, whatever it might be, I might be sitting and eating dinner, I might be watching TV. It doesn't really matter what we're doing. But if I notice that there's no pain, like right now I notice there's no pain in my knee, the idea is to notice that, celebrate that, enjoy that. So now you're celebrating, you're, you're remapping on the there is no threat, I'm in no pain, my knee is fine side of the equation. Right. So whatever position you might need to be in to, to alleviate your back pain, get in that position and just notice, ah, no pain. Back's OK. We're good. So now we're remapping that side, which has been dramatically uh, suppressed since we've experienced whatever chronic pain. So if you start to remap the pain and remap the pleasure, all of a sudden your new normal will become Whatever it is, like right now, I would never think about my left wrist. It's never been in pain, so I literally never think about it. Yeah. So that starts to become the reality for your back, is that you actually go through life and you don't even think about it because it's just your new normal. Amazing. Um, have you ever heard of the Gestalt theory? I have, yeah. So, yeah, and, and I first heard about it when I was at, um, I was taking a past life regression course. And so he said, like, you want to objectify your pain and have a conversation with it. Like, so like you're communicating yeah. with it. And what's so cool about that is you're not owning it anymore. It's like, I used to always yeah. say like, I have anxiety, I have anxiety. And it's like, when I started to understand what was going on in my body, it's like, I have cells that are anxious because they're not getting what they need. And it's so funny, like just reframing it. It's suddenly like, okay, I have cells that are, that are anxious. I've got control yeah. over that because I'm not giving them what they need compared to I'm riddled with anxiety. Like now you're owning it. And like, this is my identification. So like, it, it's so important that how we frame things. It's just like, it. Like that's a big one. It is. It's like, it's a disidentification, right? So you said it and it's, um, you can go from, and it's small reframes and it's beyond the mental, but it's a small reframe of, I have chronic pain, right? Versus I'm experiencing pain, right? And, and, and if everything is put in that frame, and, and with pain, what you do is you start to disconnect the pain from, from, from whatever you think the pain is caused from, right? So a lot of people will say that I have, I have knee pain when I do X, Y, Z. Well, okay, no, you just have pain, right? And so we can start to disconnect this reality. And this works in a lot of different things. I have anxiety. Well, I'm experiencing anxiety right now. Interesting, right? So you start to disconnect the I am, the, the association, because when we hold that frame, either consciously or subconsciously, we lock it in. We're, we're literally immersed in the experience. We're inside of it. And you'll notice this if you ever get in a, an argument, a fight, a whatever it case, you're in emotional conflict with somebody. If you start to just disconnect the feeling that you're feeling, from the experience, then it will resolve. But when we're so wrapped up in it, and this happens to everybody all the time, like it happens to me constantly, yeah. until we start to recognize, oh, okay, this is what's happening here. And then we disconnect 
right, from that. And, and, and this can be applied even in, let's say, good things, right? So whatever trauma, let's say somebody has experienced um, these high expectations, right? Um, they needed to get straight A's in school, whatever, it, whatever the case is. They, they, and, and when they did that, they got love and attention and affection and all the things that we need as children or, or young adults or what have you. Um, if we start to disconnect this idea of I only get love when I succeed, right, that's going to create this pattern. If, that, if, that's, if that's the case, we're going to operate from there for our entire lives. And it's going to produce good results. We're going to be very successful, but we will only feel loved or accepted or appreciated when we do those good things. So we start to disconnect these sort of realities from them and, and you start to own the reality of what's happening, right? I am healthy. I am loved all these things. And it's beyond the mental. It's recognizing the feeling, even gratitude is another good example, right? We can feel these things and we can notice these things anytime. And when we disconnect them from the situation that we're in, we start to embody that reality a, a lot more often. And whenever we get into conflict or whenever that situation arises, we can start to separate from it immediately. And whatever's perturbing us will start to uh, resolve and ameliorate and it's just become so much easier. Yeah, like that reframing is so key. I remember reading, I think it was in Greg Braden's work. You don't want to hope for anything. You want to know. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, hope is somewhere down the road. You want to know right. right now that you're fine. You're, 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 everything is, is, is as it's supposed to be. Right. And, and even I, I just came back from uh, Costa Rica from a, a super conscious uh, business retreat. It was fantastic. And one of the reframes was using the word results instead of goals. Cause again, goal is yeah. like hoping it's, it's like my goal, but it's down the road where the result that I'm experiencing is this and like letting your body know that, no, this, this has, this has already happened. Um, that's right. No and time and space. So, I mean, you know, we can, we can that's do right. anything by just changing the wording of how we communicate. That's right. And, 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 and there's an and here and I, and I love this. And it came to me actually through an ayahuasca ceremony that I, that I was in. Um, but it was this realization of like honoring and, and the importance of process. So there's certain things that actually can't resolve or, or be done immediately. So like, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, um, pregnancy, right? There's no way you'd want to rush that. Yeah. You, there's no process to rush that. There's nothing to rush. There's a process that is unfolding and it's beautiful. So, you know, block therapy is another good example of this, right? Doing block therapy for a day or a week is probably not going to get you the results that you're looking for, even if you're holding that reality of I'm, I'm, the result is done. So it's, it's like you hold that result as truth. Yeah. And you honor the process that is unfolding because, because there's something so valuable in process, right? Starting a business, becoming a parent, whatever the case is, that whole process. I have a four-year-old. He has a process of development. I cannot speed that up. I can assist it. I can nurture it. I can, you know, put boundaries around it, right? I can um, also just witness it, right? But it is a process. So a, a four-year-old does not have the neural development that an adult has. No matter how much I want him to get things right or to listen to me or to follow, whatever the case is, he's got a process. So this is a, also a very valuable recognition that um, most of our awakening is happening through process. And there's an instantaneous aspect of things. And there's this vision or this knowing that the results are already there. It's like, it, it really is. Awakening is that thing. I'm already awake, fully awake and aware. And there's a process of me recognizing that fully and what that actually means. And I think too, like when you really embrace that, like suddenly life becomes really fascinating because instead of like, you know, again, that goal, like I have to reach it. Like I, I want to get there. I want to get there. And it's like, but, but do you like, I mean, you know, exactly. as we're talking about, you know, um, alignment and the goal of being, you know, every cell in incorrect alignment. I always say like, none of us are going to get there in this lifetime, as long as we live in this weird dual world with gravity, yeah. but isn't it fun to be on the path and to 100%. notice the changes along the way with every step? Because every step has a gift that you want to sense and you want to feel. And if you got to from A to Z overnight, like you wouldn't experience any of that or or have any That's of right. those, you know, moments when you're in meditation and then and then those like, you know, enlightening moments come like that's that's the fun part. And you can't predict it, right? And, it's, and I see this a lot in like the finance world, right? Or the manifestation of, of money type of world where we're all just wanting this, you know, lottery type of thing to happen to us. And, and while that does sound nice and while that can be um, a beneficial thing, right? To, to sort of um, allow or invite into our world, um, it can also come with these, these more difficult processes 
as a result, right? And so you, you it, there's a there's this honoring of process. There's a, a recognition that it's already done, and there is um, an acceptance of of how it's all going to unfold because. There's so, as you said, there's so many surprises waiting for us, no matter what we get or don't get or what it happens or doesn't happen. It, it, my chronic pain, my knee pain has led me to so many unbelievable gifts of awakening and realization and people in my life and businesses and all these things. And so I, in that sense, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And it would be great if I didn't ever have it at the same time, right? So, so, so we can kind of honor, there's a both and for so many of these things. And it's just a recognition of me going forward. I don't, I don't want to suffer. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of trying so hard. And so I get to change that reality and all the lessons I've learned along the way up to this point have been so invaluable to my process. So one of the things that you're really passionate about speaking is uh, circadian biology yeah. and I mean, I think so, like I get asked all the time, like, you know, how do you sleep? Like all, all the stuff around sleep, because I think a lot of people, it really eludes them and how to like really get into that, you know, deep restorative space where if you're not sleeping, your body is simply not going to be the best version of itself. So I'm sure you have a ton to share on this and all of our listeners, I think we'll just dive into this and, uh, you know, take everything that you say. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, right? Um, circadian biology is this idea that our, that our human organism is, uh, fundamentally linked to the solar cycle, right? Um, circadian, right? And there's a 24 hour sort of uh, clock that it operates on more or less. And look, Ayurveda has known this for thousands of years, right? Going back to the beginning of, of their uh, wisdom tradition, Chinese medicine, same thing, right? indigenous populations know this. We kind of forgot about this in the West, right? To the point where in 2017, there was a Nobel prize given to three scientists um, from the United States regarding circadian biology. So now we're looking at it from the Western lens and we're recognizing the same thing that these Western traditions know, but we all inherently know this, right? If, you, if you've ever flown across time zones, you recognize that your circadian rhythm is completely messed up. Yeah. You get sick easier, you don't sleep as well, you, you can't perform you know, athletically, your mind and, and, and brain doesn't work the way it used to. All these things start to happen. And that's simply um, due to the fact that your internal clock is set to a different time than the actual solar cycle that you ended up in, right? And so um, this, the important thing I think we're realizing in the West is that this is actually fundamental to our well-being. So, uh, you know, all cause mortality increases when our circadian rhythm is disrupted. When we set our clocks forward, well, when we set our clocks forward um, here in the West, this crazy thing that we do regarding daylight savings, there's all kinds of issues, health issues that, 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 that are created, right? More traffic accidents. There's more people in the ER. There's more heart incidents. There's all kinds of stuff that happens. And that's one hour, right? When we set our clocks back, um, it actually, we see a reversal of some of these things. So we actually see improvements in a lot of these things because we're getting better sleep. But if we are not synchronized with the solar cycle, meaning that we're not getting up when the sun is rising and we're not going to bed just after the sun is setting, then we're gonna have all kinds of issues with digestion, hormones, brain. If anybody's had a child, you probably experienced this, right? In the first year or so of life um, of this new child, your sleep's a mess, right? And when your sleep's a mess, you make poor decisions. You don't eat properly. You don't exercise as much, right? Like all the, the, the important lifestyle factors that we can consider start to get disrupted. You actually don't have the willpower to overcome this. Right. Like they actually train for this in, in the military, right, on, on how to perform with low sleep. So it's something that is counter to our natural behavior patterns. Right. So every decision that we make starts to, uh, you know, not be optimal. And so um, the solar cycle peaks in the middle of the day. Right. So that's actually when our, our digestion is strongest. Right? We actually digest our meals in the middle of the day better than we do first thing in the morning or late at night. Right? We, if we're eating late at night, it disrupts all kinds of hormonal um, processes, our ability to detoxify, to process. Right? We need to be synchronized with the sun. So we should be exercising a little bit more in the morning and in midday. We should be eating our meals somewhere around you know, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Is, is the ideal window for the most difficult uh, digestive meals. Um, Temperature is important. So if we're going to bed and it's too hot, right, we will not sleep as well. The, the, the actual temperature of our body declines and we need that temperature in the environment to decline. Imagine yourself camping. And they've done this with people that have um, 
uh, insomnia. They'll take them uh, basically in nature for two weeks and their insomnia resolves, right? Because they're in that natural environment and the sun is, is helping our body to predict the functions, right? So when you're on a good circadian rhythm consistently, then your body starts to synchronize in time with the sun. So it knows when to increase cortisol. It knows when to increase thyroid hormone. It knows when to increase melatonin, right? It knows, and, and inside every one of your cells, every cell, we have clock genes. And this is where, this is related to the, the Nobel Prize winning work that's been done. We have period genes, clock genes, BMOL, all these little transcription factors and genes are actually little clocks telling the cell, telling the nucleus when to turn on these things and when to turn off these things, right? So that needs to be synchronized with our our master clock in our brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the way it tends to get its signal is through the eyes and on the skin, right? So when the sun, when the, the natural light it doesn't even need to be sunny, it can be cloudy or what have you, the natural light hits our eyes. We have very sensitive photoreceptors that are able to tell the frequencies of light that are coming through, right? When you look at a sunset, right? And it's just above the horizon, you will never see blues and greens and purples. You will only see those if they're reflected off of a cloud above because all those frequencies of light are bouncing off of the atmosphere and going back into space. So all we get is red, orange, and yellow. Those are the natural frequencies of that time of day. If we look at midday, we actually see a more blue shifted light spectrum, right? So the beginning of the day and the end of the day are all red, orange, and yellow. So that is theoretically ideal for our environment in our homes, right? So if we can get some orange light bulbs, if we can get some salt lamps, like the one I got behind me, candles, fire, etc., these are all providing an optimal frequency of light for our eyes to recognize, oh, it's night, which tells our hypothalamus, our pituitary, and every cell in our body that it's nighttime. And if the body starts to remember this, it gets synchronized, it gets yoked, then it will start to predict, oh, okay, well, I, know it's, I know night's coming up, I'm gonna do this. So that's what's happening when we experience jet lag. Your body's on a certain clock and it's predicting what functions are supposed to happen next. And then it lands in some other time zone at some other you know, position of the sun. And it's going, wait, wait, hold on. This isn't right. We're not supposed to be doing this. Okay, let me adjust, right? So it's gonna take you hours or days to, for your body to start to synchronize with the new light cycle, right? So this is absolutely critical for mood, digestion, brain function, you know, hormonal balance, right? Uh, healing of all kinds, right? So that is fundamental to sleep, right? And there are other things definitely that cause sleep disturbances, but this is so primal and so fundamental, right? If we go back and look at all life on this planet, it, it, is, it is related to this, right? Every, every organism has this function built in. So this tells us through sort of evolutionary biology, if you will, that is, it is conserved. This is an important thing for all organisms to recognize. Plants will also have the circadian rhythm. They will adjust to the light. So we're always responding. And so if we don't get that right, everything starts to suffer. So I have a question. So, you know, here in Winnipeg, you know, uh, June 21st, our longest day of the year, of course, it's light at five all the way until actually after 10 p.m. And then, you know, December 21st, it's dark oh, yeah. until eight and it's dark before five. So like there's such a crazy yeah. differential in the amount of sunlight hours from one season to another. So like, because I've, I've was born and I've lived here my whole life. Like, is, is it a natural thing for the body to just acclimatize to what you're used to if you stay in one place? Um, yeah. So this is interesting, right? Like this is, this is, and I think there's probably things that we still don't know yet, but let's take a, another extreme example. I, I'm from Seattle, so I'm very well aware of how horrible it can be in the winter. Yeah. Um, it gets very depressing. Like oh, you, Everything changes, right? But I was in Estonia for in the middle of summer and, and the sun set at like 11 p.m. And then it rose at like 2 a.m. Wow. So it like just barely dips below the horizon and comes back up. And meanwhile, even in the middle of the night, it's still pretty bright outside. <laughs> so... But, but you got to figure that humans have been, been in these places for hundreds or thousands of years, right? Yeah. So how is it that they, why did they stay there, right? How do they remain healthy? What's actually happening, right? Because we, we all don't live on the equator. And the reality is, is that, that obviously our skin changed, right? As we migrated, right, into these polar regions, right? We get lighter skin, we get lighter eyes, we get lighter hair. So this is automatically telling us that the body's making these adaptations over generations 
to it be able to accept light more easily, right? There's probably some internal clock type of receptor changes that are happening that I'm not aware of, or perhaps science doesn't even hasn't recognized yet. But if you imagine living in, let's say, Finland, right, 500 years ago, right, they just had lamps and, and, you know, oil lamps, perhaps, and these type of things. So they didn't have artificial lighting, even during the winter, but they had cold, right? So the cold is playing a role in this process, right? Um, I, I can't go into great detail, but I, I can tell you that these, the temperature itself and, and the coldness, right? I have an ice, uh, an ice bath, a cold plunge in my backyard. We know the physiological changes that are happening. So we're actually getting some compensatory, compensatory benefits and changes based off of the environment that we're in. So humans are so adaptable to any environment. We're the most adaptable creatures. We can eat any kind of diet, right? We can live in any kind of climate. And there are physiological adaptive, adaptive changes that happen over the generations. But that is assuming that we are uh, in contact with our natural environment. So it actually benefits us to be out in the cold. This will, this will change our endorphins. This will increase endorphins. It'll increase mood, right? People go into the cold plunge and the cold bath for this reason. So imagine living in that environment, right? Your, your physiology is going to be radically different. It may suppress thyroid hormone. That may be totally natural based off of seasons. Your food's going to change, right? So if, if you're eating a more, let's say, um, indigenous type of diet, right? then there's probably changes there, right? So it, it, in that reality, it's actually the, the entirety of what the environment is providing is compensating for that reality. And they're gonna be a, a, around fires more, right? We know saunas are a big thing, right? Especially in the Nordic cultures in Iceland and Finland and Sweden, right? So there's some light benefits that we're getting from the infrared spectrum. So we've created these, these, these uh, possibilities to get through those times in an effective way without losing our health. The problem with our current societies are that where most of us are spending most of our times indoors, right? So even in the, the you know, equatorial type of regions, these Western places are, we're, we're going inside, right? So we're actually missing the benefits of some of these things. We're not eating our traditional diets, right? So um, the circadian function is, is related to four primary cues, right? And these cues primary are light, Right. But food is a cue. Um, exercise is a cue and temperature is a cue. So these are the four inputs, four primary inputs that our body is going to use to determine the cycle. And in those winter months, like if I'm from Seattle or Winnipeg, there's if you were if we were living in a uh, more natural setting, there would actually be seasonal changes to our the way we express health in in the body. Right. And this is Ayurveda talks about this, right? We have the Vata time, right? So because Vata is increasing, right? We, in the winter, in the fall winter, then we actually need to start to clear this energy that builds up in that time frame and bring in some of the spring energy, right? Some of this Kapha energy. And then in the spring, we're, we're gaining too much Kapha. So now we got to burn that off with the summer energy, right? With the Pitta. And then we have too much pitta in the summer. Now we gotta we gotta you know uh, balance that out with more vata. So there's a seasonal fluctuation, right? So we have circadian rhythm, but we also have seasonal rhythm, and annual rhythm, and we have life rhythm, right? So these are just important, um, I guess, baseline understandings that everything is in rhythm, and if we can synchronize with these rhythms, so it's good to go seasonally. Right. It's good to start to, if you're in Winnipeg, go out there and get that cold. It's not fun. I actually hate the cold. I moved to San Diego because I hate the cold. <laughs> but if we can start to recognize that there's wisdom in all of this stuff, and we, if we engage with it properly, then we will remain healthy. So it's very, very deep stuff. And, and we could probably, I guarantee you, we're going to learn more as, as science starts to study this stuff. But I think for me, what I've really tried to embody is the truth behind all of it without needing to know how or why, because we just get lost in some of this. I, I find it interesting. I have a natural curiosity with things, these things. And if we can just flow with the, the way nature operates, then we're likely to, to, to benefit from it. I know. And you know, like when you say it like that, it's just like, obviously that's just the most easiest thing. Like one of the things I love, right. because, yeah. I mean, we, we, we don't quite have three months per season here. Winter can sometimes extend to like five <laughs> months, which is a little bit of an annoyance, but I love winter. I love hibernating. I love like, that's just part of it, right? Like I, I'm, I'm going to sleep more. I'm going to be a little 
less active in the winter. And like, I, I like to give myself permission that that's okay because that's where I live and it just feels right. Like, you know, to, you know, anyway, so. Yep, agreed. Um, so I, okay, one question, just to put it in like, maybe like three to five little bullet points. If somebody comes to you with horrific sleep habits, wherever they are on the planet, like what would be the three or five little things that you would say, just start here just to get yourself on a bit of a pathway to improvement? Yeah, and it's interesting because actually, no matter what they come to me with, whether it's cancer, autoimmune conditions, skin conditions, digestive issues, doesn't matter, um, cognitive dysfunction, this is one of the places I start, as we need to figure out a, are you sleeping? And if not, why? And B, how do we dial in this circadian rhythm? Because even beyond sleep, dialing in this circadian rhythm is so critical for your health. So number one, the morning is when your sleep routine starts. So when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you should do is go outside. Like within 10 minutes of, of waking up, don't get your coffee, don't take a shower yet, right? Like try to figure out a way to go outside, drink your tea, go for a walk. Go for a walk is ideal you know, 15, 20 minutes going for a walk, even in the rain or the snow or whatever the case is, just getting that natural light in your eyes. If the sun is above the horizon, this is the signal. This is the cue for your body to go, oh, it's morning. Increase cortisol, right? We're going to turn off melatonin now. And suppressing that melatonin first thing in the morning is actually critical for your this strong boost of melatonin later in the evening. So we're starting to turn on all these switches. And this is related to, um, you know, weight loss. It's related to hormonal health, uh, you know, pregnancy, if you're trying to get pregnant, anything, detoxification, right? These are all fundamental. So if we get up in the morning, go for a 15 minute walk and get that light in our eyes. If you have glasses, it's ideal actually to, to remove those or contacts. You're getting a more natural spectrum. It's not totally necessary, but it can be helpful. So again, you can just sit outside if that's your thing too. But getting that light in your eyes is really, really critical. I, um, ideally, getting outside as much as you can um, during the day. And it may be, you know, I used to work at Boeing and I was in this huge building um, for like all the entire day, right? So I never even saw the outside. But if you can get outside during your lunch or just a few times during the day, it will help your 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 eyes, your brain to, re to recognize what time of day it is. So just getting that natural light as much as you can will help so many things even beyond sleep. Yeah. Question. So um, in my apartment, so like I'm on the eighth floor of this 30 story building and I mean, I've got a river below. So like I'm, I'm in a beautiful space, but I'm floor, floor to ceiling windows throughout my whole apartment as much as fresh air is, is it the light even through a window or do you need to be outside looking at the light to get the best? Yeah. Color? Good question. I mean, so what I like to point people to is the optimal, right? The optimal is you're actually working outside, whether it's in the shade or we're not, you don't have to be directly in the sun. That's optimal. And then whatever you can do to, to sort of get to that point is, 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 is best, right? So if, if you have tons of windows uh, available and they're, they're closed windows, but they're, that's fine, right? Like that's, that's good too. Better is if you're outside, right? So it, there's, there's just kind of a spectrum. Of how that's minus 35 Celsius. I likely won't be stepping outside right out of bed. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. But as much as you can move toward that optimal is going to benefit. Um, and even the cold, right? That cold actually will wake you up. It'll start to turn on all kinds of things. So that's a good thing too. Um, but yeah, it, as much as you can get that natural light, right? Even through windows will be beneficial. Okay. Um, one more question then. So the difference between then, because I mean, I've, I've done cold plunging in my space. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So does it have to be the water or just stepping outside and just getting my body immersed in the cold air? Like, is that giving me the, the same benefits? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Not to the degree water's a, a better carrier, right? It, it can, it can hold that energy a little bit better. So it's, it's a better insulator in that way. But, um, yeah, anytime you can even, even turning down the temperature in your, in your house, right. Can actually just seasonally. Right. So like in the winter, maybe it's set at 65 or 67 or whatever it is that's a little bit chilly and you can feel that chill can actually provide some benefits. Right? I mean, you don't want to suffer, right? Nobody wants to just go through life suffering, right? So there's, there's a balance to be had, but, but just some of these things can be beneficial, right? And, and I'm speaking really to the people that are suffering, right? The, the people that I'm working with, it's like, we got we to gotta make some changes. And like, we got to kind of start to embrace the pain yeah. of, of life a little bit. And, and when we do that, we, we start to get some, some beautiful things, right? We kind of dance with the pain, right? We don't just invite suffering just because, but, but, 
if you can just go outside as much as you can, right, then that will start. And, and it's about consistency. It's not a matter of time. More is better, obviously, if you can, but just being consistent, just like exercise, right? Like if you're trying to build your body, then yeah, you're going to need to be in the gym for a while. But even just doing some movement is, is helpful, right? So if you can get outside as much as you can during the day, great, right? It, it, it can help to have that light on your skin. It can help, but, but primarily through the eyes. And then Exercise, making sure you're exercising in toward the middle of the day, right? Don't be exercising at 7 p.m. Your body's trying to wind down. We don't want to jack up your nervous system. That'll prevent um, good sleep. Don't eat too late. This is another thing, right? Remember I said that the cues for this circadian rhythm. If we're eating a meal, if we're eating our dessert or a pizza at 9 p.m., it's really, really not ideal. The body's trying to detoxify. It's trying to do other things. And now we're just loading it up and making it, you know, digest food. And you're not going to digest food. You're going to have more in food intolerances. You're going to have, you know, increased lipopolysaccharide production, which is, you know, creates inflammation in the gut and the liver. You're going to um, create more ama in, in the Ayurvedic uh, language, which is just this toxic waste that builds up in the system. So, and it, it signals these various hormones that we need um, for good, you know, leptin signaling and uh, glucagon and the ability to maintain hunger and not be, um, you know, craving foods and all these things. So if we can, if we can end our meal at least three hours before bed, that's ideal. Some people have blood sugar issues. You can have a little bit of honey, maybe an hour before bed, a couple almonds uh, be before bed. Nothing too hard to digest. You don't want, you know, a beef stick, for example, or something, right? Like you want a steak, you know, uh, right before bed an hour. So you can have a little of those things if you have blood sugar issues. But over time, with, circa with dialing in your circadian rhythm, those blood sugar issues can literally go away, right? So you may not even have cravings. But if you have a little bit of something, that, that can be okay. Because at the end of the day, if you, if you have a drop in blood sugar, um, like if you're fasting or you're trying these type of things, you'll notice you probably don't sleep as well. And that's because when your blood sugar drops, you know, your cortisol starts to rise to help bring glucose into the blood. So cortisol will rise and that will keep you awake. So we don't want to trigger that either. So, okay. It's, uh, it's June. It's light until 1030. It's December. It's dark before five. Should I be changing when I'm eating at night then to accommodate when the light and the dark come? Yeah. And this is, it's a good, great question. And it's a little bit, these type of things are a little more difficult the, the farther away from the, the equator you get. Right. But, but yes, this is where we can have seasonal shifts in our sleeping patterns as well. Right. So, I mean, it can be difficult to, to go to bed. Like when I was in Estonia, I was like, how am I, it feels like it's four o'clock and it's actually 11 PM. Like what's happening. It's hard for me to, to do this. So there can be natural fluctuations in the time you go to bed and the amount of time you sleep. So this is why I don't believe the sleep science when they say, Oh, you got to get seven and a half hours. And that's the thing. And it doesn't work that way. Right? So if the sun's setting at nine 30 or 10, right. Then you may, you may go to bed at 10 30 or 11, right? Yeah. Just the best you can do to, to kind of wake up, get your six, seven, hopefully eight hours, you know, something around there. I tend to only need about six hours of sleep, but I'm fantastically rested and feel great in the morning. So you can shift some of these things. And if it's starting to get dark at, you know, 5 p.m. because it's, you know, super cloudy and it's winter, then, you know, you may, it, you, you don't have to go to bed an hour after the sun goes down, but, but, but maybe you're shifting your bedtime from that kind of 10, 30, 11 PM window in the summer and over the seasonal changes, it starts to reduce, right? And you start going to bed at like nine. Then when I say nine, some people will be, oh my God, I can't go to bed at nine. That's ridiculous, right? But the reality is that if you're in synchronized, if you're synchronized with the sun through the seasonal changes, then you don't have to try to go to bed at nine or 9.30. Your body will just naturally, slowly start to recognize the solar changes throughout the seasons and it will adapt and you will start producing melatonin earlier. Your cortisol will drop earlier. All your processes will shift with the seasons and you will just naturally want to go to bed. But this, this also necessitates that you're listening to your body, that you're not exercising, you know, at 7 PM in the winter when the sun went down at five, right? So it, it has to do with listening to our body, but also recognizing that, uh, the behaviors that we're engaging in are very important. If I'm watching, you know, Game of Thrones at 10 PM, yeah, I'm probably going to have trouble sleeping. It's a very, you know, uh, nervous system spiking type of show. First of all, second of all, I'm looking at the a, a screen, which is, you know, blue lit backed, right? So these are the signals that a it's, it's exciting or it's dangerous. And so the nervous system is going to jump 
and there's a light source coming in saying it's not nighttime, you know? Um, so we just kind of have to pay attention to all these things and take the responsibility um, for our behaviors if we want to improve our sleep. And if we want to improve our, if we improve our sleep, we're going to improve every aspect of our reality. I think too, as you get a little older, that, that just is okay. You know, <laughs> when I'm 25, it's like FOMO. What am I missing right. if I go to bed at like nine o'clock? But now I'm like, hell, I'm going to bed. At Nothing nine good happens after <laughs> nine. <laughs> Totally. Cool. Okay. Um, so you have a really special event coming up soon in October. Let's, let's dive in a little bit and talk about this, uh, summit you're having. Yeah, it's called the ageless energy summit and it's, it's really designed. We, we structured this in a way to, um, kind of help people in their midlife, right? Forties, fifties, sixties, and beyond that are experiencing some of these things in their health that they didn't experience, let's say 20 years ago, or maybe they did, but, but these things start to crop up, right? When we're in our midlife and beyond. And I think the, what I notice is that a lot of people kind of ask themselves, is, is this aging? You know, is this, is this what it looks like? Is this just the natural course of things? Things just start not to work. You know, my hormones are a mess. I can't lose this weight, right? I'm, I'm in more pain. I'm not sleeping. Uh, food sensitivities are cropping up inflammations everywhere, right? Like this is, this is what aging can look like for, for many of us in the West. And we kind of created the summit to say like, that's actually not the necessary course, right? Yes. We're not the same as we were when we were 19 or 25. Right. And, and this is the reality, right? Like again, my son who's four years old has a stem cell pool that I like dream about, right? Like his stem cells are infinitely higher than mine which means he heals faster, right? Which means his body recreates itself more effectively than mine. This is the process of getting older. So we can acknowledge that reality and also not accept this fate of cognitive decline, hormonal imbalance, weight gain, food issues, body pains, all these things. And so we, yeah, we brought together um, 27 people that, that we felt would, would really provide a lot of value with regard to you know hormones and energy and gut health and and how to how to improve these things because when you do some of this this deeper work then these things resolve right so it's it's not the fate that that we're all destined to amazing so that's very exciting so we'll obviously have uh, the links below for everybody to be able to access your summit and yeah it's totally free by the way and it's 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 completely free so it's it's six days um, we have uh, like 30, 30 expert presentations. Um, and uh, totally free to sign up. It starts October 3rd, I believe. So um, coming up soon. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a no brainer, honestly. Um, there's so much good information and wisdom from these, these experts that um, even if, if, you, if you're looking for one specific thing, you know, it's likely we got it. Wow, amazing. So uh, Jason, um, is there anything else that you would like to share that we've missed that you feel is just so important for our listeners to know? Mm, I would say, uh, you know, we've heard for a while now, maybe the past 20 or 30 years in sort of the integrative health alternative world that, that you know, all disease begins in the gut, right? And while I don't hold that to be a self-evident truth, it is very relevant, right? So there's so much happening at the gut level. Um, and, you know, this is a, a an organism that is not human, right? We are more microbiota genetic material than we are human genetic material. Most of our function is carried out by our microbiota, right? So it's, it's kind of weird when you think about what a human really is, because it's, it's not so much human DNA. Um, it's, it's all these microbes. And so, um, this is a, a rainforest of genetic material that is carrying out so many different functions. So, you know, a lot of what, what I like to, um, help my clients with, and a lot of what we talk about in the summit, um, is also centered around gut health and pathogens and how to get that right. And when you can start to do that, um, so much of your health can change. So, um, again, I, want to, I want to acknowledge your work too, Deanna, cause, um, you know, when I found block therapy, I was, I instantly, I, I recognized how much I didn't like it because it was painful. And I instantly recognized how much I needed it and how profound it would be if I were to, you know, do this on a regular basis. And so it's, it's changed my world, um, in a, in a huge way. I try to spread the, the word as much as I can about, about what you've done. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that into my world. Uh, well, thank you so much. And I just have to say like chatting with you is so very exciting, um, uh, for me as well as our listeners, because what, what you're saying can sound overwhelming, but it's really not. Like when you get into the flow and you create the right habits, if, if we can give ourselves that little bit of time every day now, the trajectory of where we're headed is so completely different than if we don't. And why don't we? Like, why not? 
Like, yeah, it, 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 humans are conditionable. We are the most adaptable creatures on the planet. And we have been conditioned in such a way with our thoughts and ideas and our, and our beliefs and our bodies, everything has been conditioned. And so what's really cool is that we can recondition that. And that's really, I think the, the message I want to kind of like, like finish on is it's really just about this, the consistency of whatever you do, right? There's a process that unfolds. There's a reconditioning that can happen. Things can happen instantaneously. Yes. And showing up every day, just using that block five minutes a day, right? Just getting that circadian rhythm, just little pieces of it dialed in day after day. And it, it, you'd be surprised sometimes when these, um, what tends to happen, I'm from the engineering world, is that it's not a linear progression, right? It's, it's like nothing, 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 whoop, phase change. Yeah. Nothing, 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 phase change, right? So it's really about the consistency. And then at some point, you'll notice a shift, right? So it's kind of having faith and showing up every day. And you'll start to notice. And once you get that little shift, that little phase shift, doesn't have to be big. There's this like spark that just lights up inside and goes, oh my God, it's working, right? And then there's the confidence and it starts to build. And just like going to the gym may suck for the first week, first two weeks, but eventually you notice some changes happening. And those small changes are all it takes to continue on that path. Sometimes it can seem like such a long path. To, to unwind my physical ailments, to, to resolve whatever I'm going through can feel so um, cumbersome because I've, I've been at it, let's say for 10 years or 20 years, right? And what happens is, is you find the right solution and these changes can happen dramatically very quickly. And that's all you need to really get going. Amazing. Well, you've inspired me and I'm sure all of our listeners. So I just want to say a huge thank you, Jason, for all of your dedication to helping people be the best versions of themselves. Um, I, I fully believe that with this community of people that are really coming forward with all of this information that we are only going to get better as a population in the world. And that is just so very exciting. So thank you to all of the listeners for taking the time and definitely dive into Jason's Summit because you're going to learn stuff that will change your life and have a wonderful day, everyone.